Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. From 1910 to 1945, Japan ruled over the Korean Peninsula and tried to assimilate the Korean people into its empire. Part of this ambition was the suppression of the native language, for example, by ending Korean language education and newspapers. Under these circumstances, the peninsula's authors had to find new forms of creative expression, and despite these difficulties, they produced insightful fictional works, even during the last and most oppressive decade of Japan's colonial rule. To learn more about the literature from this era, and about the conditions under which it was produced, we had the pleasure to interview Professor Janet Poole. She spoke to us about some of the authors of this period, the characteristics of their writings, and about what happened to them and the reception of their works after the colonial period. Janet Poole is Associate Professor of East Asian Studies at the University of Toronto. Two years ago she wrote, When the Future Disappears, the Modernist Imagination in Late Colonial Korea. Poole received her PhD in East Asian Languages and Cultures from Columbia University, her MA in Korean Literature from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and a BA in Japanese and Korean from the University of London. Professor Janet Poole, welcome to Korea and the World. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for inviting me. To begin, what got you interested in Korea, and especially in its colonial history and the literature from the time? I guess I became interested in Korea way back um, in the late 1980s, when I was studying Japanese in London. The late 1980s was the time of the economic boom in Japan, and I enjoyed learning languages, so I started studying Japanese. But um, I had the opportunity to learn Korean because I was at a, a school called the School of Oriental and African Studies, and there was an old man, Professor Skillen, teaching Korean. I was interested in Korea because I had been working in Amnesty International, and my local group had a South Korean prisoner that we had adopted as our group prisoner of conscience. And so I was very curious about what kind of place South Korea would be. I'd only heard about the economy, politics, the protests, and I just wondered what else was going on in there. And I've always loved literature, so it was natural for me to go to Korean literature before anything else. And for the colonial period, I think, you know, really, there's probably two reasons. I started by learning Japanese first before I learned Korean. So it kind of maybe naturally led me to a time when there were deep connections between the two cultures and languages. But I think at this point, what, two, three decades later, I also realize I have a kind of affinity for colonial era literature. To give some context to this discussion, could you briefly introduce the situation on the Korean Peninsula during the period that you focus on in your book, that is, the late 1930s and the early 1940s? Well, the period of the late 1930s and 40s is what I call the late colonial period. It's important to remember that at the time, people didn't call this the late colonial period. That's the term we use now, that the colonial period is over. But it's a time when the Sino, the Second Sino-Korean War had kicked off in 1937. The Pacific War started in 1941. And it basically, through the decades of the 30s and 40s, is a time of emerging and actually happening global war. It's also a time of um, the rise of fascism around the world, not just on the Korean Peninsula and in the Japanese Empire. It's a time when, um, in some ways, the economy is booming with the advent of war. So there's a, it's this kind of strange moment that kind of begins with the Great Depression in 1929 that reverberated around the world and on the Korean Peninsula then leads into what some people talk about as a kind of nascent industrial revolution under wartime conditions, which makes it a very specific kind of industrialization that's going on. And it's a time also characterized by great migration from the countryside to the cities. Korean cities are growing. By the end of the period, there's about a million people in Seoul, which is um, hugely more than before. People are also migrating in other directions, up to Manchuria, all over to Japan. But also into the cities in Korea. So it's um, in some ways a very dynamic time. At the same time, it's a very desperate time for many people. 
why did you decide to focus on this particular period and not, say, the early years of Japan's colonial rule over the Korean Peninsula? Right, it's a good question. I think one thing that intrigued me about the late colonial period in terms of its literature is that it's paradoxically, maybe, the time when a lot of the fictional works that are considered canonical today were actually written. So the general kind of narrative is that um, the late 1930s and 40s saw the oppression of Korean culture and the suppression of its literature. But when I started to read um, Korean works, initially in translation, I was really struck by the fact that so many of the works that were most famous and most often translated were actually written in the late 1930s. So this seemed kind of contradictory to me to say that literature was being suppressed and yet here all these famous works seem to be, have been written. So I think that was one of the big questions that started me going in trying to figure out you know, why this moment, which was so dramatic, historically produced this proliferation of fiction. And then when I started to read the fiction, I became more intrigued because it doesn't usually directly reference the dramatic events that we think of today when we think of the 1930s. So I became interested in the kind of question of silence or the ways in which events might be referenced indirectly. And that to me was quite intriguing. Most of the writers whose works you present in the book were born during the first decade of the 20th century. Would it be fair to say that today, well, and their works, are the product of the colonial era, and maybe even that they didn't know life outside of the colonial era, they didn't know a free Korea? Um, yeah, I think to some extent we can say they're the product of the colonial era, as long as that um, I wouldn't want to kind of limit their meaning to being a, a um, direct reflection necessarily of what was going on at the time. But I do think of these writers as a kind of distinct generation of writers in that um, they were born on the verge of colonial rule. So they don't have a direct experience of pre-colonial times. Now they've heard about it from their parents endlessly, I'm sure, um, and from other books or the world around them, but they haven't directly experienced a non-colonial education. They've all been in the colonial education system which means that they have a kind of shared experience which is quite distinct from that of their parents. So there's a kind of a um, rupture, a generational rupture, if you like, that these writers have experienced that I think um, gives them something in common. It also means that they tend to be bilingual to various degrees of fluency. Many of them um, studied Japanese, many of them also studied in Japan at a time when it was hard to study at the, at the university in Korea. So to that extent, they're very much a product of the colonial education system. But we have to bear in mind that, you know, even the colonial education system, or when we say the colonial era, that's not just one thing. So people can live that in many different ways. Let's now dive in and talk about the works you write about in your book. In an interview, you said that, to quote you, I found it hard to make sense of the stories. Why is that? What I was referring to then maybe reflects my not very sophisticated <laughs> literary reading practices, especially in the beginning when I was reading these stories. I think we have a tendency sometimes to expect literature to directly reflect or reference a particular history, especially if we become interested in a particular literature because of a certain history. And then when you go to the stories, you don't see any kind of direct reflection. You don't see what you're expecting to see. And that was certainly the case for me with um, late colonial fiction, which tends to be quite pastoral, it's heavily nostalgic. It tends to present a world where maybe there isn't that direct reference to violence and there's not often direct reference to colonialism. So, for example, it's often said that, you know, there's very few Japanese characters in colonial fiction, which is strange because we know, we've studied um, who lived in <laughs> Korea in 1930s and Japanese lived everywhere and clearly Koreans and Japanese were interacting. 
but that kind of interaction appears relatively rarely. It is there, but it doesn't appear as often as you might expect. So these were the kind of, I think, mysteries or puzzles that I had to try to work out for myself, is why at a time of so much violence would someone write a very pretty story about rural life? Why, at a time of when so many people were poor, why would there be, you know, stories focusing about shopping and the urban commodification and things that seem quite um, grand? So one example would, or maybe one thing that I then had to do was not only deal with how I was reading the stories, but also dealing with how other people read the stories and then trying to come through that to my own particular way of reading them. So when it comes to the stories that tend to be quite nostalgic and pastoral, these kind of very pristine Korean villages in colonial times, it's common for people to say that this is mere escapism, that the writer is just trying to avoid the horrors of what's really going on. And I had to kind of um, think about whether I agreed with that reading, and I guess ultimately I don't think it's just mere escapism. I think there's a much more going on, if you like, that there's an actual historical significance to having these stories in these rural villages. And so I came to think of it as more of a displacement. Instead of escaping or avoiding something, it's kind of displacing it with something else or some other kind of representation. And I think that's what writers were doing at the time. And so the stories then became stories which were speaking to a much kind of broader historical experience, so not just the experience of war, but the experience of, of urbanization, of influx of capitalism. A lot of these stories that show kind of a supposedly pre-modern rural non-capitalist economy, these stories appear and seem to take on the same rhythm of stories that are set in the urban centers. So it's a similar kind of rhythm of circulation that you see in stories which show the flaneur walking around the streets of Seoul or whatever. Um, and so I had to try to sync these two together, not as trying to avoid an experience, but to try to evoke it in another kind of language. In your book, you analyze how these writers looked at the future, and your starting point is something that you refer to as tense of future interiority. What does this term describe? Well, I borrowed this idea um, specifically from the work of Tani Barlow on Chinese feminism, although quite a few scholars recently have been thinking about the future anterior tense as a way to rethink the way in which we think about history. So future interior, anterior tense is the tense of the kind of what will have been, right? A kind of future in the past. So it's really, to write a history in, in the tense of future interiority is to try to think about how the experience was thought or imagined at a particular moment of time. And by doing that, to try to separate it out from what actually happened afterwards. So in the case of my book, it was important for me to think about how these writers, this group of writers, imagined their futures especially because um, the way many people think of these writers today is, is so conditioned and overdetermined by what their actual futures became. Um, most of them went to North Korea. In many cases, it was kind of surprising. Many of them ended up executed or exiled later on. So they had um, often tragic endings, and it's very tempting to look back at their work in the 1930s and try to find the kind of seeds of what happened to them later on. But is that really the only way we can think of them? Is there a way that we can kind of respect who they were in that moment and how they were imagining their future might have been? And I think it seems to me this is, this is important for many different histories, but certainly for writers who moved to North Korea, I think it's particularly important because what they imagined as their futures when they were walking across the 38th parallel to North Korea was, I'm sure, very different from what actually happened, right? And in a world today where North Korea is so demonized and we all have such a strong narrative of what North Korea is, it's important in going back to the 1940s to realize that it, it wasn't that then, it was something else. So what was that? Can we do justice to these writers who chose to go to that place? by trying to understand what they thought they were doing at that time. 
another big way in which the idea of writing a history in the future interior tense is helpful for thinking specifically about late colonial career is the fact that um, so much of the thinking and writing about late colonial career is governed by the fact that we know that the colonial period ended. In other words, it's governed by the fact, the very fact that we call it the late colonial period. When people at the time did not think, oh, I'm living in late colonial times, no one knew that three or four years later they were no longer going to be living in the Japanese empire. So I think it's important to read their works with the knowledge that they did not know that this was going to end. They did not know the, what, 60, 70 year history of debate over collaboration and how that was going to taint their legacies. And so I think, although when I, I started to write the book, I kind of had to make the decision to what extent I was going to include discussion on what happened to them after or kind of historiographic discussion of how these writers are read today or across time in the post-colonial period. But I decided not to do that, to kind of deliberately avoid that as much as possible and to focus on what their writing might have meant in that moment they were writing with the knowledge that ultimately I don't really know. But I think it's an important kind of um, intellectual and political venture to try to imagine them in a without that collaborationist future that, that they have ended up getting. The title of your book is eye-catching, When the Future Disappears. Could you tell us a bit more about what you mean by that? And ultimately, how did this writer imagine the future? Right. Um, this title came to me quite near the end of writing, actually. The whole time I was writing the book, it was called Unruly Detail, which probably suggests how confused I was as I was writing it. Um, but towards the end, um, it's just one day, suddenly the, the phrase, when the future disappears, arose. And I think it really captures the kind of big dilemma that they were living and also the dilemma that I was trying to tackle when I was thinking about this idea of future anteriority, which is that I was trying to think about how they might imagine their future. But in reading their work again and again in the kind of fictional narratives, you see stories where there really doesn't appear to be any future, or at least the future is very hard to see. So at the most kind of basic level, characters and stories tend to die they don't know what to do. They walk round and round in circles and feel confused. They can't kind of plan their future life. And so this is quite distinctive to that moment. You might say, well, that's colonialism, and some people say that. But if you look at early colonial works, it's quite striking how future-oriented they are. Even in the, what, 1910s, which is another period known as a dark period that's full of grimness and despair, in fiction in the 1910s, there's a, there's a lot of stories where characters are dreaming of a better future and how they're going to save their nation and build themselves. The idea of self-made man or woman is very important. But in the 30s and 40s, it's really noticeable that this sense of futurity disappears and there seems to be other senses of time that come to the forefront. So there's a lot of looking to the past, sometimes nostalgically, sometimes not. There's a lot of kind of being mired or entangled in the present. There's a, the emergence of an idea of the everyday that appears a lot, both in um, fictional and non-fictional writings. The everyday as a way of thinking about this kind of present moment, particularly in urban centers. And then at the end of the late colonial period with people like Che Jae Sa and those who decide to take up the mantle of the Japanese empire, there's a kind of dramatic reintroduction of a future and a promise that you will have a future, it's in the Japanese empire. But then the irony is that when you look at the future that they're talking about, that future is actually death on the battlefield, right? It's, as Yi Guang Su said at the time, you have to become Japanese. To become Japanese, you have to learn Japanese and you have to pick up a gun and fight on the battlefield and die, ultimately. So the only way to your future is to die. So even that, that future that's offered at the end of the period it is full of kind of contradiction. And so I was trying to think about the very complicated entanglements and sense of time that characterizes these stories where there doesn't appear to be any clear way to see a, a future 
but yet there seems to be an effort to try to imagine a different future, a better future, a future that's different from the present that we're living now, but yet that very act of imagination is hard. Could you give us an example of how this imagination of the future appears in the literature of the time? Sure, I think maybe one good example of that would be in the work of Ite Jun, who was a very prolific writer at the time, who's known as um, an antiquarian and sometimes a traditionalist, and sometimes he's merely accused of being feudal. But he's definitely an, an antiquarian, and, and I find the kind of idea of antiquarianism or what I call romantic antiquarianism quite interesting and quite distinctive to this period. Because often when we think of antiquarianism, we think of it as a kind of backward-looking act, right? That the antiquarian loves his antiques and sits looking at them, thinking of the past. And Ite Jun definitely collected antiques and he would sit with them at night, <laughs> talking to them and writing about talking to them. But I think it, it's um, a mistake to think of this as a purely backward-looking gesture. First of all, when he, he's sitting with his antiques, there's this kind of intense sense of the present. He has these kind of moments of epiphany or a sense of a kind of expanded self or an expanded subjectivity. So when he sits on his own at night in the dark with his antiques, that's when he feels kind of maybe the greatest sense of self. And that sense of self can then stretch in different ways. It can stretch across time into the past, but I think it can equally, it, it becomes equally timeless in a sense that it could kind of stretch into a future. So at the end of his essays, he has a very famous collection of anecdotal essays called Musorok, um, which I've translated as Eastern Sentiments. At the end of his essays, which are very often about antiques, he um, writes the journal of a visit to Manchuria. Now, within the Japanese Empire in the 1930s, there's nowhere that most encapsulates an idea of the future as much as Manchuria. It was the kind of experimental dreamland of Japanese imperialists where they tried to have all these kind of agricultural experiments. A lot of Japanese leftists went to the, there after the formation of the puppet state to try to produce their version of kind of agrarian utopia. A lot of Koreans also moved there. And Ite Jun traveled there to look at some of these experiments, to look at the cities, and then also to visit a Korean farming village to see how Koreans were living there. And at the very end, the very final sentences of the whole collection, he talks about returning to the station, walking across the Manchurian desert away from this Korean farming village, and he's on his own, and he's walking, he walks past a couple of children singing a song in Korean, Japanese, and Chinese, in three languages of the Japanese empire. And then the story, then it just ends, actually, in silence, with his footsteps going across the desert with the echoes of this song in the imperial languages. And I think that's a kind of moment where we see the imagination of a future, maybe subtly, but how he's perceiving the future of um, the kind of diasporic future of, of Koreans. And so this is why I call it romantic antiquarianism, because although he supposedly looks backwards, it's romantic in the sense that romanticism is always looking forward, even when it looks to the past. It looks to the past in order to look forwards, not to escape to the past, right? And so it produces, romanticism produces these kind of works of soaring imagination. It seems to me that if you were a Korean intellectual in the late 30s, 40s, when you felt that the language you used was perhaps disappearing or at least changing in status noticeably, it seems to me that these kind of moments of soaring imagination could be quite comforting maybe, or certainly enabling, enabling of a different kind of imagination of your present and, and where that might take you in the future. Another theme you mention is nostalgia that is very present in literature. Could you tell us more about this? Right, I think nostalgia often kind of in some ways captures the spirits of the time in many different realms, both in literature and in the popular media. 
I became interested in nostalgia through a Marxist thinker called Sian Shik, who in the late 1930s wrote、um, an essay about the prominence of nostalgia in his time. And he's referring to the kind of craze for the past that was coming up in many different ways. This was a time when, from the mid 1930s, the popular press were getting very interested in Korean tradition and publishing old stories, publishing、um, stories on excavations. Archaeological excavation was very popular, often done by Japanese archaeologists, but the results would reach the popular press. There was a lot of interest in traditional Korean literature and performance, and a general kind of interest in thinking about what Korean tradition was. And I should add that this was going on simultaneously in Japan. This was not unique to Korea, and in fact, it was going on in, in many cultures around the world. And and in some ways, you know, it's quite. Common to societies that are undergoing rapid change, especially rapid material change, as the landscape around you changes, you start to feel nostalgic for what was there before. If you live in Seoul, you see your old little lane being re-asphalted and turned into a major street with electricity, and you see higher buildings rising, and you start to think about the past, and and it often seems better than the present for many different reasons. So nostalgia. It was very common, but I became interested in it because of the way in which this writer Sain Shik was was trying to distinguish between different kinds of nostalgia. So he diagnosed three different kinds of nostalgia. The first one was the、uh, what he called the feudal nostalgia. His example of feudal nostalgia was actually the antiquarian Itaijin. So the feudal nostalgia for Sa was a kind of thinking about the past and being immersed in old objects and a kind of Escaping from the present, and it was bad for him. <laughs> the second kind of nostalgia he called the modern nostalgia, and this was the nostalgia of the generation that I referred to earlier of these young intellectuals born around the beginning of colonial rule, who had lived through the nineteen twenties, which was a time of quite dynamic social movement, the rise of Marxism and communism, and a lot of excitement, the rise of the new modern literature. Um, which coincided with their youth, you know, rather importantly, their teenage and nineteen twenties. From nineteen thirties, they're hitting their midlife at that time. Midlife now doesn't start till what fifty or sixty, but back then it, you were hitting midlife in your thirties. And this whole kind of generation, this first generation to be schooled in the colonial education system, were hitting their kind of midlife crises, if you like, in many different ways. In the 1930s, and tended to be getting very nostalgic about their youth, right, and the kind of early days of modernity and the kinds of possibilities that it held.、Um, that when they thought about their youth, like many of us, they thought of a time when they could imagine a, a better future. But now that they were in their thirties, they couldn't imagine that future anymore. It was being stymied in all different ways. So this was what Thoreau called the modern nostalgia. But when it gets really interesting, because I think neither of those are maybe so surprising. What really interested me was the third kind of nostalgia that he found in his time, which he called the decadent nostalgia. And this nostalgia was for him a more kind of universal sense of nostalgia and sense of rootlessness, and disquiet with the present that would appear only in paradoxical ways. So things that are ugly. Are sick would somehow create some kind of power to to produce disquiet in the present, and it was in this kind of、um, paradoxical nostalgia,、um, which was very present based while being nostalgic. It was in this kind of nostalgia that he held out some kind of political hope for a future, for some kind of upsetting of the way things are. So I became very interested in the idea of a decadent nostalgia, and then I followed this through into some writers who who I think were writing in a very kind of decadent style, to try to think about what that meant to them in that moment. And I tend to agree with Sal that 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 was a way in which, in that particular moment, decadence could provide a way to both critique the present. And try to imagine something that could be different, yet 
under the conditions where you can't really imagine what that different future actually is, you can point to it, you can gesture to it through that kind of disquiet. And that could be politically and intellectually more significant than producing a kind of refurbished idea of tradition. Is it fair to say then that this writer just assumed Japanese rule would just keep going and would continue indefinitely? And that as a result, Korea as a state, maybe even as a culture, would just ultimately just disappear? To some extent, maybe. I think it's maybe not that clear cut. It's tempting to look back and say, well, some people were just waiting for colonialism to end, because we know it did, in some ways anyway. Or to say that they didn't care, so they went along with what was going on in the Japanese empire. But I think actually, you know, the, the kind of daily life tends to take over in many cases. We're not always sat thinking about these grand state level changes and believing that they definitely will or will not happen. I want to at least entertain the possibility that people could be writing without the idea that there was going to be freedom post-colonial career in the foreseeable future. Maybe there would be at some point, but they put, most of them, I think, didn't think it was going to happen so quickly. It came rather unexpectedly, even though maybe in the last few months of the war they were hearing rumors that it, it wasn't going well. But at least in the early stages of the Pacific War, Japan was doing very well, and it would have been hard to imagine that that state wouldn't con continue. So I think no matter whether you, you might hope something might change, but you don't know it's going to change and you're going to have to go on, you, people do go on living irrespective of whether that particular kind of change of state will come or not. And I think it's important to read these works in that way, not to project the end of the war onto them. Think about what they were making of in this moment, which is a, a lot murkier. Another kind of paradoxical event of Japanese colonialism is the way in which it tended to focus attention onto something called Korean culture. And even in the late colonial period, when Korea was supposed to be no longer a colony, but a region of Japan in the rhetoric of total mobilization, this is always a kind of paradoxical thing, because on the one hand, it's a kind of demotion from a colony to a region. On the other hand, it's declaring a region called Korea, so it's giving something a name. And so it maintains the focus on a particular idea of a culture, and the idea of Korean culture was really focused on a lot from, from both sides, both colonized and colonizer. So in terms of whether they, they thought there would be a Korean culture or not, it's important to think about the possibility that that would not necessarily mean an independent state, that Japanese imperialism was already multinational, and so a Korean culture or Korean identity or a notion of Korea could coexist within Japanese imperialism and was rather separate from the idea of an independent state, which we tend not to think about it, the situation in that way today, but at the time I think that that was what was going on. So there isn't necessarily a distinct notion of a nation of Korea to raise in opposition to imperialism. There can be different ways of exploring Koreanness within imperialism, if you like. As part of the war efforts, Japan tried to bring modernity to the peninsula. How did contemporary authors perceive this convergence of old and new? Well, the idea of modernity was um, heavily discussed at the time. Um, I have to say, personally, I don't agree with the idea that Japan brought something called modernity to Korea. I conceive of modernity as more of a kind of temporal notion of the globe at the time, that world was within modernity, and so was Korea. But it's definitely true that modern things, or the word modern, became affixed to many different things that um, were then perceived to be foreign. So you might have heard of like the modern girl or modern life or the idea of the modern, modern jazz, um, all these different kind of cultural things that were very popular or, or modern culture was very popular at the time. I think because these things tended to be called modern, it tends to produce an idea of the old, the things that are not modern. So the very word modern produces the non-modern. The word new produces the old. There is no content to newness. 
other than what it takes up in different moments and different places. And the idea of newness can only come with an idea of oldness. So when there's so much focus on new things, as there was in early 20th century Korea, you then get this kind of um, production of, of old things that you see in the antiquarians and the traditionalists and such. But that very thinking of the old things is itself something new, if you like, that the, the very way of being modern in 1930s Korea could be to become um, very interested in the past. So the antiquarian might be the, one of the ultimate figures of Korean modernity, right? I think that the convergence of old and new then, they're always going to come together. It's not possible to separate them out and be one or the other. But having them together is not always going to be a comfortable experience. Some people may revel in it and enjoy it, play with it, but for some people it can be quite traumatic to be living multiple times at once. Um, and I think that's what you see in, in some of these write writings. So, for example, some ways in which this appears is um, in the short stories by Lee Tae-jun, there's a really obsessive interest in the figure of the old man. Almost every story seems to be about old men, and the old man who's not coping with modern life. He lives in the city, and he doesn't understand why people do the things they do, why they like social dance, why life isn't going on the way they knew. So the figure of the old man for Lee Tae-jun became a way to try to express this disquiet with the present in the figure of the old man but yet the figure of the old man for Ite Jun was also you know his main material for his very modern fiction from which he made a living so the figure of the old man was in and of itself already a convergence of old and new for for Ite Jun and that it, it appears to figure oldness and and it does to some extent but it's a new figure, it's become newly significant in that moment. So that's a kind of example, I think, of the ways in which the convergence of old and new are, are really central for writers expressing their experience at this time. So another example or another way in which the kind of old and new converged in fiction was in these stories that are located on the outskirts of Seoul. And I wrote a chapter about this kind of new space that of course has always been there, but is, is taking on new shape and significance in the literary imagination. And part of this um, results from a kind of expansion, a literal expansion in 1934 of the city boundaries. So whereas Seoul had been a, a, a traditional walled city, in the mid-1930s, the colonial authorities expanded the boundaries of Seoul to reflect the growing population. So therefore, the old city walls were no longer the administrative boundary of the city. And at this time, there's quite a few writers who were either already living in the gap between the city wall and the boundary, or who moved to the gap. And I came to call this Perry's Urban in the beginning. I was thinking of it as a kind of idea of suburbia, but... I felt that the word suburbia, the term, tends to evoke kind of American suburbia rather too strongly. So I stuck with the idea of periurban in the hope that the idea of the periurb as the kind of perimeter, the space surrounding the city, doesn't necessarily point to a particular future that the suburb points to. So the stories of the periurb are set in this new space that's within the city of Seoul, but not within the city walls. And there's quite a few stories from this period that talk about life in these places, looking at the city walls from the outside, but yet being within the city. So these stories are often set in Songbukdong, which you can go to today. And you will see that, as I'm sure you know, that the city walls have been newly refurbished and rebuilt and, and packaged as a, as a tourist circuit in Seoul today. And actually are rather wonderful to walk around today. If you walk around the city walls today, it's kind of hard to imagine that Songbukdong, which is on the outside of the walls, was actually at that time pretty mixed, pretty rustic. Today it's just full of apartments, but at that time it, it was a, a mixture of kind of farming, paddy fields, and some new building development. So it, it's a perfect example of a ki kind of spatial convergence of old and new, where new houses are being built for nuclear families to move into that are in the midst of old pre-existent communities that are 
farming, mostly farming or rustic huts. So it's a very kind of mixed space where interesting stories happen. One of the writers you focus on is Chue Che So. He wrote in Japanese, supported the war waged by Japan, promoted worship of the Japanese empire. You see in this, and I quote, the powerful attraction and comfort offered by the possibility of becoming Japanese. Doesn't this mean a vision for the future in which Korea becomes fully Japanized, but that doesn't actually look back at its past, unlike the re-enchantment of the past or this nostalgia you talked about? Right. Che Che So is um, a really interesting figure because he had actually been central to the emergence of a modernist movement in Korea in the 1930s, and he had really championed Korea's young writers. He was a, a scholar of um, English literature and English modernism who had introduced English modernist works to Korea. And so he had been heavily invested in Korean language literature. And it's quite surprising to find him in some ways in the late 30s suddenly becoming a champion of the Japanese language and writing in Japanese. He'd written in Korean previously. Um, he even says in a preface to his 1943 book that he realized he'd always been Japanese, which is, I think, one expression of the kind of complicated sense of temporality at this time, to realize that he had always been something. But I think it's important that when he says he realized he's always been Japanese, it doesn't necessarily mean he, he thought he was in Korean, that in some ways these can coexist, and I think they do for Trey Jae himself. He didn't actually, as far as I'm aware, change his name, which is quite unusual for prominent intellectuals at the time, especially intellectuals who are so focused on supporting the Japanese imperial project. So there's some contradictions in Trey Jae Saw in this moment. For him, realizing that he'd always been Japanese, so a kind of rewriting of his past was a way to find a different future that maybe could be comfortable in the sense that I feel that when I'm reading his writing, he had felt the kind of limitations imposed on him through being a colonial subject. So he writes in 43 that he'd always felt that he's kind of, it, it's almost like a kind of shadow boxing that he, it's almost as if he feels that somehow as a colonial subject, he cannot be like a, a real critic. Whereas by becoming Japanese, you feel in some ways he's relieved of this burden of colonial subjecthood. And maybe this coincides a bit with a lot of talk at the time with the um, total mobilization and assimilation policies and the idea of changing your name. One way in which this was presented to Koreans was the enticement that they would become free from discrimination, that if you, you know, change your name and spoke Japanese, then you could be Japanese, and then you wouldn't suffer the kind of discrimination that you suffered as Korean. And I think that we have to take seriously the kind of attraction this could offer to a certain group of fairly elite Koreans who maybe in their very kind of elitehood, <laughs> elite status, feel the kind of psychological burden of colonial subjecthood more strongly than others who experience colonialism maybe as financial deprivation or violence. But for those who experience colonialism more as a kind of psychological effect, I think the idea of becoming Japanese could be very attractive. And I have a sense that that is what Trey saw saw in it so he, he w wasn't so interested in nostalgia but he did by the 1940s anyway he did say or write that total mobilization that that imperialism could be a way to kind of clear up what he calls the messiness or dirtiness of the past right that he f seems to feel that he wants to i think overcome a kind of what he sees as a messy past and move into a more clear hopeful future and this offers him one way of doing it or at least he thinks it does at that moment in his, he has a famous work from 1943, a collection of essays written in Japanese, and it has a preface which I find in deeply moving where he talks about the death of his young son, um, who died very young. And in the preface he says that um, your death will be kind of um, redeemed through, it was with your death that I moved into the project of national imperial literature. So it's, it was 
really kind of strange when I first read it, the idea that the death of a son, which had clearly really touched him and, and affected him very deeply, that this death could somehow be expunged or assuaged, maybe not deleted, or he wouldn't be writing about it. He's not forgetting his son. That it could be somehow assuaged through the project of joining up with Japanese imperial literary project. To me, it speaks to the way in which, you know, he could somehow overcome a painful past or past of pain by raising this much more clear, transparent project of joining the Japanese empire. That the very fact that he kind of has to start with that very elegiac note to the sun tells me that he hasn't forgotten that at all or the past. So I think that even for Che Jae Sa, um, his writings can seem very clear and abrupt, you have to die for the empire, but the impulse there is, is maybe more complicated than we sometimes give him credit for. An issue we would like to briefly discuss is that of censorship, which you describe in the book as, and I quote, one of the defining features of colonial literatures. What kind of censorship did these writers have to actually deal with on a daily basis? Well, I think that censorship is always going to be central to colonial literatures. I mean, actually, it's, it's central to cultural production in general. In colonial literatures, colonial cultures, it takes on maybe a more overdetermined presence in that the colonial surveillance uh, mechanisms were quite strong. So typically at this time, there were different ways in which censorship were imposed. A lot of it was through um, censors reading through works after they were printed but not yet published. So if a publisher printed something and, and used all their resources and paid the expenses to do that and then found they couldn't circulate it, they would be in financial trouble. So these were the kind of strategies that were used. Censorship seems to be uneven. I haven't looked at it in huge detail, to be honest, that people who have say it's very uneven, it differs in different forms and genre, it seems to differ between writings that have a large amount of, say, Chinese characters that are used in Japanese language as well, as opposed to writings that have less of that. So Korean fiction tends to not include Chinese characters, which is interesting, it tends to be in, in Hangul and it seems to me to be less subject to censorship in a way. I deliberately didn't write about censorship in my book because, as I think I said, I wanted to um, think about what was produced within that realm. Um, when you write about censorship, it's hard to avoid thinking that the writer really wanted to write something else, but I actually think that the more profound effect of censorship is in the way it kind of shapes our thinking so that even before you get to the point of, oh, I'll change this word for that word, even before that point, your thinking has kind of been formed in a certain way. So I'm not interested in going back and thinking what particular words changed. I'm more interested in what actually did come out into the public sphere. I think that with language, and especially literature, the power of literature is the fact that it speaks otherwise. It does not speak directly. So it's a very powerful tool against censorship. And language in general has that power, but literature has much greater power. So what might not be said in a newspaper editorial or a political speech could maybe be evoked in a fictional story. And it can be hard to pin down what it means. Now, there will always be cases where the censor says, I know what you're talking about, <laughs> this is no good. But I think that in general, I'm amazed at what people managed to say in the colonial period, even in the 1940s. I'm, I'm always amazed at what people managed to say. And that tends to surprise me more than what they didn't manage to say. So I really wanted to focus on that productive aspect of literature in, in, under those conditions. Earlier, you mentioned the absence of Japanese figures and reference to the colonial regime. Is it fair to assume that it's a direct result of censorship? That's interesting. I've never thought of it that way, to be honest. Um, I don't think I would make that assumption. I can't say exactly why there are so few Japanese characters in fiction. Censorship could maybe impact certain negative depictions of Japanese characters, 
that we know through all kinds of anecdotal evidence that Japanese-Korean individual relations did not just take on negative values, right? So why are there not more positive depictions of Japanese characters in Korean fiction? There aren't. So it suggests to me that this is more a question of the kind of geopolitical imagination, that there's ways in which the kind of imaginative space of literature is configured. And this seems to be to not include Japanese characters at that time. It's maybe a little bit like I just said, their literary writing tends to rely mostly on Hangul. Why is that when everyone knows Chinese characters and they write and use them in other forms of writing? Fiction, the space of fiction seems to have evolved with these kind of distinct imaginative parameters that take on a, a geopolitical valence, right? And maybe that's connected to the role of fiction in a colonial situation, because I think under colonialism around the world, literature is very important. It's more important than in other societies. And that makes sense if we think of um, a time when most institutions are colonial institutions, whether it's the government, the university, media. The media is, is some are colonial owned or some less so, but it's also heavily censored, I would say a lot more than literature, I would imagine. At this time when the main inst- representational institutions are colonial, there has to be another space where other stories can be told, and I think literature took on that role. Um, Literature, you have to remember, it, it doesn't really cost much to write, or publishing costs a bit more, but in general, you can do it on your own, and you don't need that much money. So that paradoxically gives it a lot of power, and it makes it a very powerful opportunity space. And that's what I see going on in in literature at that time. In South Korea today, the end of the Korean period is, as you mentioned earlier, seen as a dark period. And as you write, there is a, and I quote, reluctance to discuss this period. Why is that? I mean, I think at the most fundamental level, maybe, one reason is because it's a time where there are kind of different visions of what the future will be that are non-national. And accepting that kind of undermines ultimately what the idea of the state today. When I say that there's a reluctance to discuss the dark period, um, I'm thinking more in kind of popular discourse because there's no doubt that academics talk about it a lot and there's been a lot of really great research done on it in the past decade or so. So it's no longer the case that it was a couple of decades ago where people didn't really know what had happened or what was going on. There's a lot of research, but it still remains, I think, in the popular imagination as a kind of dark period where people don't want to, where if you look at it, you have to confront issues that are maybe uncomfortable, such as, you know, people find they have grandparents who really liked speaking Japanese or family members who did have Japanese names quite happily, or maybe not happily, but who had lived under those names, right? And that's hard to talk about today because the whole kind of course of post-colonial Korean nationalism is built upon rejecting that had ever happened, right? It's built on the idea that the nation is sacrosanct and no one would ever be willing to give it up. So talking about this time when people indeed were and did is difficult. What happened to these authors once the colonial era was over? Well, they... um, ultimately tended to meet rather tragic ends and it was hard for me to stop that overwhelming the whole book. The majority of of writers and artists either stayed in the north or chose to go there. Not everyone but a pretty large um, majority of cultural producers. Of the writers in that I discussed in detail in my book um, almost all of them went to the north or stayed in the north. In the case of Choi myung he had always lived and worked in Pyongyang, so that's not so surprising. But when people like Lee Tae-jun, who you know, was a rather dilettante antiquarian, when he upped and moved to the north, I think that move has been hard for people to understand. In the beginning, he was a kind of VIP. He went on North Korean cultural missions to the Soviet Union and to China, and he continued to write. But by the early to mid-1950s, 
the kind of factional disputes in North Korea were underway and Kim Il-sung was tightening his grip on power and and the victims of that were really the, the so-called Southern communists that included a lot of these modernist writers. So they tended to meet unhappy endings. In, in Lee Tae-jin's case, we don't really know what happened, but we think he was sent into exile twice, so sent out to the countryside. There are different rumors about what happened to him. Some of them seem almost a little too poetic to be true, but it's said that he was working in a printer's shop or he was building bricks in a factory. No one knows when he died. In the case of Kim Nam Chan and Im Hwa, who were both leaders of the colonial era socialist movement and went north as would be expected, they fell foul of disputes and were both executed in the early 1950s. So their fates tended to be rather tragic after about a decade after colonial rule. Che Jae Saw is the one writer I wrote about who stayed in the South, and he was initially rather quiet, but then took to writing about Shakespeare and continuing his English studies. He's always, you know, his life's work is very much tainted by his decidedly collaborationist work but on the other hand he did have the future so the endings are are very fraught almost all of them why did writers decide to go to north korea in such numbers was there a certain affinity that revealed itself was it that what would become the south korean regime wasn't inclined to accept his writer what was it I think the move north from these writers is really an essentially kind of post-colonial act in that the colonial era created a kind of society that they felt deeply uncomfortable with and I think North Korea seemed to offer a more a preferable alternative more successfully than South Korea did at the time. So, you know, some of these writers, the former socialists, choosing to go to North Korea is not surprising because already the South was soon becoming heavily and violently anti-communist. But for writers like Lee Tae-jun when they go north, I think it's more that they see a kind of affinity or a sense that their ideals, their goals will be maybe better protected in the north. In the case of Lee Tae-jun, throughout the colonial period, he writes repeatedly about the kind of evils of commodification and the kind of effects that capitalism has had on, on not just the city, but on art specifically. So I can understand how a society that's kind of pledging to get rid of commodification might be seen by someone like E as a place where art would be better protected, and art was very important to him. You also have to remember that North Korea was a dynamic and constantly changing society, and when people moved there, not only did they probably believe that, or I think clearly believe that, Korea was going to be united and probably under the agency of the North. But the North seemed to offer just better opportunities, right? A more more like the society they wished for. We just spoke about censorship during the colonial era, but in your book you also write about a triple censorship, uh, one that goes far beyond the limits of the colonial era. Could you tell us more about this? By triple censorship, I was referring, I guess, three kinds of censorship. Um, First would be the colonial era censorship that these writers underwent to publish at that time. But the other two kinds of censorship I was thinking of as kind of um, post-colonial and and Cold War. So until 1988, writers who went to the North, whether willingly or not, because some were kidnapped and taken there, But no matter the reason, if they went north, their books were banned in South Korea until 1988, which now seems, you know, that's what, three decades ago? Maybe it's beginning to feel like a while ago, but, um, you know, that's actually four decades into the foundation of North and South Korea. So for the first four decades of South Korea in the kind of foundation of a a narrative of South Korean literary history, some of the major, major figures of colonial era literature were not mentioned or included. So Lee Tae-jin is a good example of that. He's just not mentioned in early literary history. So you get a very kind of distorted story of colonial literature, which tends to exclude the writers that were considered most important or most popular at the time. 
Since 1988, when these stories were allowed to be published again in the South, they have、um, attracted a lot of attention. But I think the kind of、um, after effects of that long censorship is still quite apparent, especially in English translation, because English translation of Korean literature has not caught up with the fact that these writers are now published in Korean. So, so there's a kind of disjunct between the kind of colonial literature that's presented in English and what people can now read in Korean. And of course, in that process, you know, some writers fare better than others. So a major figure like Lee Tae-jun, I think, has been in some ways fully rehabilitated to literary history. But other writers like Choi Myung-ik kind of fall through the gaps, and not perhaps accidentally. So when I was first doing my research. And I came across the works of Choi Myung Ik. I was amazed. I mean, he's absolutely my favorite writer from the colonial period, and I, I I couldn't really understand why more hadn't been written about him, why people weren't reading his work, until it, it kind of finally dawned on me, rather slowly, that you know he was the writer who poeticized Pyongyang, his hometown. So there's a reason why today in Seoul people are not so interested in Choi Myung Ik, right? Whereas Lee Tae Jun, who kind of captures the ambivalence and the tragedy of the move north, I think is is a lot more readable in some ways. So that history is still very, even though the overt censorship is over and the works are published, I think that history still colors very much. Who gets read and who doesn't get read, and how their works are evaluated. I think Choi Myung Ik would have a much higher evaluation if he, if his colonial era works had been about Seoul. Moving on to the conclusion, your book is based on a close reading of a small number of authors. Do you think the insights you derived can be generalized to speak for the writers of the era in general, or even for the Korean people of the time? Right, it is a small group of writers, and the reason for that really is I, I'm quite committed to close reading and looking at texts in detail as a kind of reading practice, in general for literature, but especially for colonial literature that doesn't usually receive the respect of a close reading. But I think that、um, in terms of whether they speak for every Korean writer at the time, I mean, obviously not every writer, but I think I have a A fair sample of different positions. I tried to include a fair sample of different positions. So I think that the issues they raised would have been faced by every writer at that time, and they would have faced them differently. As I, I tried to show, the antiquarian Lee Tae Jun had a different experience of colonialism to the Marxist critic Sao Yin Shik, who disappeared. One reason we can't write more about Sao Yin Shik is that we don't know what happened to him after 1941, and there's reasons for that, but we don't really know what they are. So, I can give a much more fuller explanation of Lee Tae Jun by virtue of the remain the extant written record. But otherwise, I I think it's a fairly fair range of positions in terms of generalizing it to the Korean people. I wouldn't want to go that far. I think that we have to remember that to be a writer in colonial period of time, you are from a certain class, a fairly small minority of educated elites, and we have to remember that that's what we're dealing with when we go to literature. And you can't really get a different experience out of it. And I wouldn't try. I I think the proletarian literature movement is just as elite as the others. So I I wouldn't say this is the real face of the worker or the peasant. So I wouldn't want to do that. I think what it does give you, that's in some ways generalizable, is a picture of the emergent bourgeoisie in colonial Korea. Because I think these writers, the kind of dilemmas they had, are very much representative of bourgeois problems. The self-made man or woman who is learning new skills and trying to build a career from them. And make their way through life as they're supposed to do in modern times. And as writers, they kind of represent one path of doing that, of becoming successful through a kind of professional career, rather than through kind of family connections. Although at this period, you would kind of need those family connections as well, just to be in the position to be able to write. So I think we have to read them as as telling us something about that specific bourgeois experience. Expanding on that very quickly, who was the readership? Right, I mean the the readership would have been fairly small by today's standards, but expanding dramatically from what it was the previous decade. 
obviously to um, to read you need to be literate and literate to a fairly high degree the works are not that easy to read I think there's dispute about rates of literacy in colonial Korea but most people seem to come to the conclusion or the, the most commonly uh, mentioned figure is about 20% literacy 80% illiterate so that's already eliminated a lot of readers to some extent it's a small group reading each other's work but as the colonial period went on and the many many more Koreans entered the education system and so the numbers were increasing rapidly so that's kind of one of the tragedies of what they face is that just as the 1930s heralds the dawn of the Korean language press by which I mean there was a lot of talk about the fact that you could actually make money and be independent by publishing in the 1930s whereas in the 1920s you had to spend all your money and go into debt and people tend to do it from nationalistic purposes or goals so just as these writers are becoming successful and the possibility is beginning to be raised of becoming an independent person through writing that's when the the publishing controls come in and the korean language press is shut down so that was a real blow even though some of them went on to publish in japanese even writing in japanese was clearly decreasing with the rationing of paper and, and the like so wartime was not a time to to set out on a career as a writer. Going back to the readings of these authors, can the insights you find be generalized or at least related to the literature that was produced in other colonial and fascist regimes of the time, uh, for example, Europe? Absolutely, as long as we, you know, by the idea of generalization, we also remember some of the specificities. Certainly there are a lot of issues in common between colonial literatures around the world and between fascist literatures. Certainly writers in France under the Vichy regime faced similar dilemmas that colonial Korea's writers faced when they were trying to decide whether to write in Japanese or not. So there's a lot in common with that experience that writers in France faced and certainly the results in France could be just as tragic. I've just finished reading the Sweet Francaise by Irene Nemirovsky, who died in Auschwitz, and reading her depiction of rural France during the war was kind of really interesting to me. Um, I think one difference, and that's only one particular novel, um, one difference between that and Korean writing at this time is that, that she seems to be able to very kind of directly represent the ways in which French society is moving and the double crossing and and the betrayals are are pretty stunning and this is not a retrospective novel she's writing it as it was underway although admittedly it wasn't published until decades later and so maybe that points to the one difference although the certain experiences would have been in common there's still a kind of disparity when you have a kind of colonial fascist culture in that Fascism in a colony can, in some ways, fall maybe even more heavily on on writers. So the purpose of colonialism is already to prevent the kind of full representation of society's reality, which in some ways I could see in Sweet Francaise, although that's very silent on, say, the Jewish question and not accidentally, right? In Korea, the degree to which things cannot be spoken maybe, maybe, maybe slightly more intense, but in general... I'm in favor of reading these cultures together. And some of the simultaneities are pretty amazing. You know, a lot has been been written in English on modernist cultures that if you read Korean literature from that period, you see the same issues, the same questions being brought up, whether it's about writing under a fascist regime or living in a, a rapidly developing society. And people are writing about fairly similar experiences at the time. So I'm inclined to think about the idea of a kind of global modernism and a global experimental response to a very dynamically changing environment that often seems to have more in common with each other across space than across time. So the way I think of it is that I think these writers in colonial era Seoul often felt they had more in common with writers in Europe at the same time than they might have with their own fathers because the degree of kind of rupture across the generations is so great. 
and that is because of colonialism rather than fascism per se. So that that's where the kind of diff- the colonial difference comes in. To conclude, could you share with us maybe an excerpt from one of these authors that you think is representative or that speaks to you maybe? Sure. Um, I'd like to read a, a section from an anecdotal essay written by Ite Jun called The City Wall. And I like this excerpt for the way it kind of shows the ways in which in his everyday life he was living that convergence of old and new, the past and the present, but at the same time the way in which he was he was kind of asceticizing it in a tense of disappearing. So in a way I think it's very resonant to the idea of a disappearing future and the idea that's often said, and I think Walter Benjamin said it, most eloquently, maybe, that the kind of flash of beauty that rises at the moment of disappearance, and in some ways this characterizes Itaijun's writing from the 1930s. So this is him describing when he'd moved to a house in Sombukdong, which you can go visit today. It's a traditional tea house, so the, which is rather ironic, but still he's describing how he gets up each morning. Each morning I step up to the inner yard with toothpaste on my toothbrush and turn around to find my eyes drawn towards the hill across the way. The clusters of the city wall follow the shape of the ridge, sometimes rising above it and sometimes falling short of it. With the high parts of the old city wall as its first target, the sunlight in Sombukdong radiates out and down from the wall on the top of the hill. If you gaze up for a while, You can clearly see the gaps between each stone and the shadows cast by the pine trees hanging their branches down over the wall. As I brush my teeth, I often find myself surprised by the illusion that it's those stones that I am brushing. And then when I look up again with my eyes, freshly washed in cold water, I can't help but feel that those walls look more beautiful when the sun sets behind them than in the morning light. In the evening the walls are an unparalleled sight. Those weathered granite stones appear through the haze as if lost in smoke, while the evening sun, bending at its waist in order to shine, is no longer mere sunlight, but a spotlight shining upon an ancient work of art. Professor Poole, thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.